All right, well, great. Thank you for all being here. I'm going to talk with you about human carnivore conflict across our Namibian conservancies. And my two co-authors are Gabrielle Fleury and Monty Nkumbwa. So please, if you see us, if you have any questions, we're happy to help answer any questions after this. I'm going to talk about conflict um, globally on carnivores and African perspective. The global cheetah problems, cheetah conservation fund, and what we're trying to do, Namibian conservancies, and our integrated livestock and predator management programs, which we call Future Farmers of Africa, which we've been conducting for over 15 years. The world is kind of in a bad state. We're losing a lot of our species. 37% of our terrestrial species are going to be lost, as they say, unless we do something. There is extensive carnivore decline and shrinking of our geographic ranges, primarily due to loss of habitat and fragmentation. That around the retaliatory killing, which we all know a lot about, and the illegal wildlife trade. And in an African context, the guilds of carnivores and other species are all um, cause problems to people. And again, we all think probably as conservationists they're beautiful, but to most farmers, they're not. And not just predators, but all of our different species are causing our world problems. A lot of these have to do with the fact that we have low wild prey populations and poor livestock health. And that is kind of a recipe for problems and conflict. Poverty also is increasing. Livestock uh, protection it makes livestock protection much more difficult. And livestock throughout Africa is both a sign of wealth as well as that of a social status. I have to let you know where cheetahs are and why we work so hard for cheetahs. And there are only about 70, 100 cheetahs found throughout Africa, the green areas. The last of the Asian population is down to about 40 or 50. There are 20 populations that are less than 100 individuals. Most of them are found in Southern Africa. Many of my cheetah partners are in the room here. And most of the cheetahs are found outside of protected areas. That's why Future Farmers of Africa is so important. We're based here in Namibia, and we do have one of the last remaining larger populations of cheetahs. I founded the Cheetah Conservation Fund in 1990 after working for a lot of years. We're an open to the public research and education center. We're also a wildlife reserve and model farm, and I have to really state that because it's important. We're a sanctuary, we've got orphan cheetahs, unfortunately, uh, but we have a veterinary clinic, we work throughout the cheetahs range, genetics laboratory, a dairy and a habitat restoration program. And we are based, importantly, within the Waterberg Conservancy and the greater Waterberg landscape, which are the areas that I'm gonna talk about today. So we heard a lot about Namibia's conservancies, and they are uh, large, and I'm going to talk about the two that are circled there. Remember, conservancies are areas that are not game-fenced, because you have heard a bit about game-fenced farms. Our wildlife is free-ranging. We're about 44% uh, of the country is in conservation land, and from that, we do believe in consumptive and non-consumptive utilization, and about one out of every four people in Namibia are actually involved in conservation in some way. We started doing Future Farmer of Africa training programs in 2005, and from that it has grown. We've worked with people throughout all of Africa, and in the early part of 2015, we started intensive training programs in the area that I'm going to talk about, which is called the Greater Waterberg Landscape. There's four communal conservancies there. Then this year, we started in an area up in the Western Conservancy landscape. They've asked us to come in and help with conflict around an area called Apua. The questionnaire surveys have gone along with our um, our trainings, we've done pre and post training, and we wanted to understand more and explore the conflict in those areas. Understanding the farmer's needs to assist so that we can be more effective in the work that we do in reducing conflict, and to monitor and evaluate um, if training improves livestock management and helps reduce livestock losses. Our area to start with is the Greater Waterberg Landscape. We're in the center of the country, as you can 
see right here. Um, Cheetah Conservation Fund is based there. This is the Waterberg Plateau National Park. And these are our four conservancies <coughs> called the Greater Waterberg Landscape. We've got about 16,000 kilometers square around the Waterberg National Park. And we're dealing with about 23,000 people. We also have critically endangered species in this area, which are wild dogs, uh, black rhinos, as well as the cheetahs. In 2012, we went into this area and we did a needs assessment to find out. We'd worked with this community for quite a long time and we were brought forward with a, um, um, a big grant into the five landscapes and it was an EU grant um, and we were able to understand more about what was going on in this area. So the Greater Waterberg Landscape is an area that has very high density of livestock, about 15.5 hectares per livestock unit, um, and it's overgrazed, bush encroachment, and reduced grazing is there. Very low wildlife densities throughout the area. There's no zonation um, within the area or limited of the land. Very few jobs, 99% of the people have income from communal livestock. And there are predator sightings and predator problems within these areas. So after doing the needs assessment and working together with the landscape uh, going forward, we were uh, brought together the whole landscape and they've come together with their aims, which were to reduce conflict and retaliatory killings. And they asked to have training provided, so we looked at rangeland management training, integrated livestock, wildlife, and predator management, and livestock health training. And a lot of this was supported by the EU. So our training programs have been very interesting. We um, do a bit of everything around looking at livestock management and record keeping so that we can have best knowledge on what's happening with the wildlife. In our trainings, this is going to be pretty much about what's gone on over the last um, two years. Between 2015 and 16, though, we started doing monthly trainings. Although we were doing periodic trainings, our monthly trainings in eight of the different conservancy um, areas, two areas per of uh, four conservancies, we went for an entire year on a monthly basis to try to get to know the people, to engage them over an entire year period to find out how well they were doing. Um, and so again, we were dealing with all these different aspects as well as the use of the livestock guarding dogs. What I'm going to present to you today is more about our surveys that have gone on between 2016 and 17. What we did by going into those areas for the first year it allowed us to understand where the high conflict areas were. Um, and those are the areas that we've actually focused on then in the last couple years with our training. With the surveys that we did um, in 15 and 16, we dealt with about 231 farmers. Of course, the majority were males, but there were 30% females within it. The age distribution, I don't think, is all that um, unusual, but 60% of the farmers, communal farmers, were between 31 and 50 years of age. Numbers of households. I mean, when you go out into a village, I think it's really interesting that the average number of households were 20 per village, and the average number of people per household was about uh, 11. And then we did opportunistic surveys within these um, human wildlife conflict hotspot areas, and I will pre be presenting that mixed in with the conflict data that I'm going to share as well. The people who came to our workshops, um, 65% of them have been to one of our workshops before, so it ranged between 1 and 11. And um, that was very interesting, and the average number of workshops that they had attended was uh, about four, uh, 5 to 6. And people who had attended more workshops had actually significantly less livestock losses. So these are the numbers of respondents and the numbers of workshops that they had attended. So education, we feel, is very important. 
On predator sightings, asking the people where they had seen and what they knew about predators. And I'm sure if you went around Europe, most people wouldn't be able to tell you the difference between a cheetah or a leopard. And many of the farmers also often don't know the differences in many of our predators. Uh, we found that most people in the area that we were working on had seen uh, wildcats on a regular basis and obviously jackals on a regular basis. But the uh, the serval is an animal that looks a lot like cheetahs. They're very, very rare, and people did not get them all the way right. But we found that if people attended a workshop and we trained them on un understanding what animals were out there and teaching them about them, we found that between the first and the second time that they'd attended a workshop, it actually increased up to about 100%, minus that of the serval. And so again, getting people to know what they're dealing with and how they're dealing with it can help us understand more about what their problems are and where the animals are living. Just to give you an idea of the numbers of livestock these 231 people had, um, 32,000 with an average number of about 80 cattle, um, goats, and sheep. The number of losses, though, 95% of all the people had livestock loss, losing almost 9,000 head of livestock. That's about 28% of the livestock uh, numbers that they owned. Um, most of it was, though, 39% um, due to predation, but 61% were two other causes. And so if we could deal with getting rid of those 61% of the other causes, it can also um, increase their um, economic livelihood and probably reduce some of the conflict with the predators. We found that smaller villages had uh, more significant livestock loss. A larger village with so many people, the predators don't seem to go around there. Smaller numbers of villages, seems like the predators will try to sneak in with the livestock out there. We did find that there was significant difference in size of village. The areas there, there was conflict um, throughout the, the areas from the different species and the size of the circles, primarily the gray being that of the uh, Jackal showed the areas of the hot spots that we were working with and the size and, uh, of the problems that we were working with. 80%, 86% of the losses were caused by the Canidae. That is that of the, more of the, than that of the Felidae, more of um, jackals and wild dogs than that of the cheetahs and leopards. And most of it were to calves um, and to small stock. And then this shows the graph of the numbers of losses that were blamed. 56% um, of the losses were from jackal and 30% by the African uh, painted dog. And then understanding this, so most of the losses were the cheetah and to the wild dog, we asked them how often they saw these animals. And the jackal they see every day, and the wild dog they hardly ever see. And even though the wild dogs are out there, they're an animal that uh, people don't like very well. And though, if you were losing 9,000 livestock, you would think that there'd be a lot higher retaliatory killing. Well, we found that it was actually quite low. About only 8% of the people that we interviewed had actually killed the predators. And so the people that we're working with, they've got problems, but they're not out there actually killing animals. A big loss was that to the wild dogs, which are critically endangered. And in the community that we're working with in a couple years, um, we've got about 450 wild dogs. Actually killed about close to 10% of the, the population. Our livestock management mitigation um, techniques are what we teach. Things like ear tags, vaccination supplements, and using that in corrals. Less people in these areas are using livestock guarding dogs, as well as that of herders. But we found that individuals who actually um, attended more than one training used more management techniques. Again, more training showed that they had less losses. And so if you've got better management tools, that's that toolbox, not just one tool works. And then from our programs um, in pre and post, we found pre workshop knowledge, that only 3% of the people out there had actually some knowledge about livestock loss. And at this point, I always ask, how many people here are a livestock farmer? 
Okay, so I see five people in the room. Um, and so I bet you guys probably don't know, if you guys do, but I bet the rest of you don't know a lot about livestock management. But after a training course, we actually found that 96% of their knowledge increased in helping take care of their livestock management. And from that, we found that 64% of the losses could be reduced through basic training. And that's in husbandry disease, birthing problems, and the use of poisonous plants. 49% said that their livestock was healthier after a year or after the workshops, and 70% have developed resources to implement best practice. That means they'd sell one of their cows and use it to get vaccines or possible supplementation. The area that we worked out in the Western Conservancies is way up north. We worked with about 117 farmers, and then our post-workshop, we worked directly with 30 of the farmers to find out what their practices looked like and what their problems were. Most of them could not tell the difference between a brown or a spotted hyena. They could not tell the difference between a cheetah or a leopard. Eagles prey on chickens and lambs, and the baboons raid their gardens and kill lambs. Of them, 2,100 livestock loss occurred. 15% only was to predation, and 85% were to other causes. The most of the other causes were that of drought. Drought was about 40%, and that of um, other issues like disease, which was probably incorporated with that of drought as well. So our problems really were that in these areas there's inadequate grazing and water sources, and with that, livestock have to go large distances. They'd go out for a week, two weeks at a time, three weeks, unattended without herders, and that ripple effect had an effect on the livestock health as well as their predation. And so some of the possible solutions that we've looked at is to use predator deterrents, e shepherd collars, corrals at night, the use of livestock guarding dogs, and the income from wildlife and tourism if rangeland management can improve. So our conclusions on this is only 15 to 39 percent of livestock losses were to predation in the two areas that we're working with. Um, one is high, one is low. The remaining 59 to 85 percent can be reduced through training and education. So we will continue with our Livestock Guarding Dog Program. We've already placed about 650 dogs in a 25-year period of time. We'll work on camera trap surveys to understand more about the occupancy and the densities. We're going to start this year an East Shepherd Collar Pilot Study, and we're going to be using fox lights for corrals and the introduction of wildlife in some of the areas in the west, excuse me, in the eastern communal areas would be very important, and we will continue with our training. Thank you.